A journey around the rivers of America and Europe. Part 2. A Journey Around the Rivers of America and Europe, Part 2 Table of Contents Rivers This illustrates some common features of rivers. This is a representative profile of a river from the source to the mouth of the river. This shows the typical profile of a river from its source to the sea or ocean. This shows the typical longitudinal and cross-sectional profiles of a river. As the gradient decreases, there is a greater amount of meandering of a river. This shows the erosion and deposition process that leads to the bending and meandering of a river. As the bending of a river increases, there often is the cutting off of a bend leaving behind an isolated oxbow lake. We will next have a short video clip of why do rivers curve. Compared to the whitewater streams that tumble down mountainsides, the meandering rivers of the plains may seem tame and lazy. But mountain streams are corralled by the steep walled valleys they carve. Their courses are literally set in stone. Out on the open plains, those stony walls give way to soft soil, allowing rivers to shift their banks and set their own ever-changing courses to the sea. Courses that almost never run straight. At least not for long, because all it takes to turn a straight stretch of river into a bendy one is a little disturbance and a lot of time. And in nature, there's plenty of both. Say, for example, that a muskrat burrows herself a den in one bank of a stream. Her tunnels make for a cozy home, but they also weaken the bank, which eventually begins to crumble and slump into the stream. Water rushes into the newly formed hollow, sweeping away loose dirt and making the hollow even hollower, which lets the water rush a little faster and sweep away a little more dirt, and so on and so on. As more of the stream's flow is diverted into the deepening hole on one bank and away from the other side of the channel, the flow there weakens and slows. And since slow-moving water can't carry the sand-sized particles that fast-moving water can, the dirt drops to the bottom and builds up to make the water there even shallower and slower, and then keeps accumulating until it becomes new land on the inside bank. Meanwhile, the fast-moving water near the outside bank sweeps out of the curve with enough momentum to carry it across the channel and slam it into the other side, where it starts to carve another curve, and then another, and then another, and then another. The wider the stream, the longer it takes the slingshotting current to reach the other side, and the greater the downstream distance to the next curve. In fact, measurements of meandering streams all over the world reveal a strikingly regular pattern. The length of one S-shaped meander tends to be about six times the width of the channel. So little tiny meandering streams tend to look just like miniature versions of their bigger relatives. As long as nothing gets in the way of a river's meandering, its curves will continue to grow curvier and curvier until they loop around and bumble into themselves. When that happens, the river's channel follows the straighter path downhill leaving behind a crescent-shaped remnant called an oxbow lake. Or a billabong. Or un lago en herradura. Ou un bras mort. We have lots of names for these lakes, since they can occur pretty much anywhere liquid flows, or used to. Which brings up an interesting question. What do the Martians call them? At the mouth of a river where it enters a much larger body of water such as a lake, bay, gulf, or ocean. The speed of the water decreases, causing the increased deposition of silt.
resulting in the formation of a delta and distributaries. Continental divides Here is a continent. These are rivers flowing down into the oceans on either side of the continent. This is a continental divide separating the two rivers or watersheds. How do you go over a continent by water? By a canal connecting one watershed to another. Since rivers are not navigable throughout their entire length, the canals must be located below the head of navigation, where rivers become navigable by vessels of larger size. A continent can have more than one divide between watersheds. How do you go over this continent by water? By canals connecting one watershed to another. Sometimes there may be a lake in the interior basin of a continent. This can be used as a connecting link in the transcontinental waterway. Examples of this are the Great Lakes in North America which provide a link between the St. Lawrence River and the Atlantic Ocean on the east and the Mississippi River and Gulf of Mexico on the south. Or Gatun Lake and the Panama Canal across the Isthmus of Panama. Gatun Lake carries ships for 21 miles of the entire 50-mile length of the canal. A lock is a section of the waterway enclosed by gates at either end to allow ships to be raised or lowered to a different water level in this example. A ship enters the upper level and the gates close behind it. The water then drains into the lower level, lowering the water level of the lock in the ship. When the water level of the lock equals the level of the lower canal, the lower gates open and the ship can proceed. This is an animation of the operation of a lock. We will next have a short video clip of how canal locks work. A canal connects two bodies of water that may have different water levels. Ships traveling through the canal move from one water level to another through a lock, a rectangular chamber with watertight gates at each end. In the lock, the level of water can be raised and lowered by a system of valves and water passages. Suppose a ship is traveling from the higher water level to the lower. First, an operator at a nearby station opens the lock gates at the high end, the ship enters the lock, and the lock gates are closed. Next, the lock operator opens one or more valves so that water from the lock slowly drains into the lower section of the canal. When the water in the lock is level with the lower water, the operator opens the gates and the ship sails through. To move a ship upstream, the procedure is reversed. The Ryan Rhone Canal connects the Ryan River to the Rhone which flows down to the Mediterranean. The Ryan Rhone Canal is 237 kilometers in length, but is suitable only for small craft. This is a lock on the Ryan Rhone Canal, which has a total of 112 locks. As mentioned before, we will look primarily at the most popular river cruises in Europe, those on the Rhine and the Danube. This will include the two-week cruise between Amsterdam and Budapest. 
and the longer three-week cruise between Amsterdam and Bucharest. We will first investigate the basic geography of these rivers, and how it is possible to make this long journey from sea to sea, from the North Sea to the Black Sea. However, it must be admitted that neither end of the cruise actually reaches the sea. Amsterdam is not actually on the Rhine and is close to, but not on the North Sea. And Bucharest is not on the Danube, although cruises do reach the Danube Delta at the shores of the Black Sea. Now with that understanding, let's look at how it's possible to go from sea to sea through Europe. Rivers do not go across continents much less any extent of landmass from one sea to another. Narrow bodies of water that do are usually called straits, sometimes referred to as channels, or less often as passages. That is certainly not the case with the Ryan and Danube. Two good examples of straits are the Bosporus and Dardanelles Straits in Turkey that connect the Black Sea to the Mediterranean Sea with the small Sea of Marmara in between. Straits can vary greatly in length and width. It is interesting to note that the Bosporus Strait is the narrowest in the world, being only 800 meters wide between Europe and Asia. Some other examples of major straits in the world are the Strait of Dover, between England and France, which connects the North Sea with the English Channel, the Strait of Gibraltar, the only natural passage between the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea, the Bering Strait between Alaska and Siberia, which connects the Pacific and Arctic Oceans, the Strait of Magellan, connecting the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans north of Tierra del Fuego, the Strait of Hormuz connecting the Persian Gulf and the Oman Sea, through which Persian Gulf petroleum is shipped to the world, and the Strait of Malacca, which is between peninsular Malaysia and Sumatra, and connects the Indian Ocean with the South China Sea. It is one of the highest volume shipping lanes in the world. The Rhine and Danube river systems have their sources very close to each other, just a few kilometers apart. Yet they flow in very different directions and empty into seas very far apart. The Rhine flows north into the North Sea, a part of the Atlantic Ocean. The Danube flows mainly east and empties into the Black Sea. The Rhine and Danube river systems are in geographically separate drainage basins separated by a continental divide. This map shows the main European drainage or watershed divides, red lines, separating the drainage basins or catchments, green regions. The main European watershed is the drainage divide which separates the basins of the rivers that empty into the Atlantic Ocean, the North Sea and the Baltic Sea from those that feed the Mediterranean Sea, the Adriatic Sea and the Black Sea. Of interest here are the Rhine and Danube watersheds or drainage basins. The Rhine Basin includes the Rhine and other smaller rivers that all drain into the North Sea. The Danube Basin includes the Danube and a few other smaller rivers that all drain into the Black Sea. The Northern Drainage Basins, including the Rhine and other basins that have rivers flowing to the north, drain into the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. The Southern Drainage Basins, including the Danube and other basins that have rivers flowing to the East Rhine into the Black Sea, which, in turn flows into the Mediterranean Sea. Others that flow to the South go into the Mediterranean Sea. The dividing line between northern and southern drainage basins or watersheds is the European Continental Divide. 
Any water transportation between the North and South, between the North Sea and the Black Sea, must go over this continental divide. This is the European Continental Divide Monument on the Main Danube Canal. This shows an example of the East-West Continental Divide in North America. This divide follows along the Rocky Mountains. Rivers to the west, such as the Columbia and Colorado, flow into the Pacific Ocean. Rivers to the east of the divide, such as the Mississippi, flow into the Gulf of Mexico. There are other continental divides in North America in addition to the Great East-West Divide, for example, there is the Eastern Divide which goes along the Appalachian Mountain Range. Rivers to the east flow into the Atlantic Ocean. And rivers to the west flow into the Gulf of Mexico. There is also the St. Lawrence Divide. Where rivers to the north flow into the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River. And thence into the Atlantic Ocean. Rivers to the south flow into the Gulf of Mexico mostly by way of the Mississippi River and its tributaries. Turning our attention back to Europe, the Alps of Switzerland, France and Austria are the direct or indirect source of much of the rivers of Europe. The snowmelt and rainwater descending from the Alps are the source of four major rivers, Italy's Po, Germany's Rhine, Austria's Danube, and France's Rhone. It is interesting to note that none of the four major rivers flow west. The Danube and the Po receive most of their waters from the Swiss Alps. But neither the Danube nor Po actually originate in the Alps of Switzerland. There is the Rhine Rhone Canal, just north of Basel, which allows a river boat to make it all the way from the North Sea to the Mediterranean. It connects the Rhine to the Du River, which connects to the Seine River, which in turn connects to the Rhone. However, the Rhine Rhone Canal, with a length of 227 kilometers, has 112 locks and only allows for a maximum boat width of 5.1 meters, or 16.7 feet and a length of 127 feet. So it is unsuitable for river cruise boats. The Danube starts in the Black Forest of Germany. Its largest tributary, the Inn River, which is Austria's longest river, flows from the Swiss Alps through Innsbruck in Austria, and then connects to the Danube at Passau in Germany. The Po also doesn't start in the Swiss Alps, but major tributaries that feed the Po do, such as the Olio, Adda, Ticino, and the Dora Baltia. The Europeans have connected the entire continent via canals. That includes the Russians who have created the Volga Don Waterway. The Volga Don Waterway connects the Neva River of St. Petersburg Sea Red Star, on the edge of the Baltic Sea near Finland to the Volga, Europe's longest river. There are cruises on part of this route. Is for example this Uniworld cruise from St. Petersburg to Moscow on the Neva River, Lake Lodoga, Svua River, Volga Baltic Canal, to the Volga River, and finally the Moscow Canal. How is it possible to connect the Ryan and Danube River systems to provide a waterway corridor across Europe from sea to sea? These two rivers are tantalizingly close to each other in the Black Forest region of southern Germany, near where they begin.
but then they diverge and go in opposite directions. As we have seen, the Rhine flows north into the North Sea, a part of the Atlantic Ocean, and the Danube flows mainly east and empties into the Black Sea. This map shows how close the Danube and the Rhine are to each other in the Black Forest region of southwestern Germany. One very major problem is that this point of closest approach is well above the head of navigation for both rivers, especially for the Danube. The head of navigation is the farthest point above the mouth of a river that can be navigated by ships in. Many cases this limit can vary greatly with the size of the vessel and the seasonal water level in some cases. It is fixed by the presence of a waterfall or a dam without locks. For the Rhine, the head of navigation is Basel in Switzerland under normal conditions. For the Danube it is Ulm in Germany for barges, but from Regensburg for larger craft. From Basel in Switzerland to Ulm in Baden-Württemberg, Germany, the straight line distance is 203 kilometers, or 127 miles. From Basel in Switzerland to Regensburg in Germany the straight line distance is 372 kilometers, or 231 miles. In fact, a canal from the Rhine anywhere south or upstream of the region around Mainz would face extreme difficulties in getting across the mountains and hills on the eastern side of the Rhine Valley. We can see this more clearly by looking at this larger scale view of the mountainous terrain between the Rhine and Danube valleys. The answer to a connecting link between the two rivers is the Main River from the Rhine. And then from the Main River, the Main Danube Canal to the Danube. Between 1836 and 1846, the Ludwig Canal, or Ludwig's Canal, named for King Ludwig I of Bavaria was built between Bamberg and Kelheim. This canal followed roughly the same route as the present-day Main Danube Canal. The construction of the Ludwig Danube Mine Canal started in 1836 and was finished ten years later in 1846. To go over the Continental Divide required a total of 101 locks, which made the passage extremely costly in terms of time. The passage of the entire canal required about six days, and all of the way from Amsterdam to Vienna took two months. This canal had a narrow channel, with many locks, and a shortage of water in the peak section. So the operation of the waterway soon became uneconomic, especially given the rapidly advancing construction of the railway network in southern Germany. At the beginning the Ludwig Danube Mine Canal was profitable, and the highest volume was reached in 1850. However, just ten years later in 1860, the Bavarian Maximilian Railway, Bayerische Maximiliansbahn, was completed. The expanded railway was a faster alternative and the canal declined in importance. The canal suffered heavy damage during World War II in 1945 and was finally closed in 1950. This is a map of the Ludwig Canal or Ludwig's Canal between the Main River at Bamberg and the Danube at Kelheim. One big difference between an ocean cruise and a river cruise is all the locks along the rivers. This is a map of the entire route of a cruise between Amsterdam and Budapest. And this shows the profile of the route over the continental divide from Würzburg near the Rhine to Passau on the Danube. 
This is the river profile from the junction of the Rhine and Main to the Danube River, showing that many locks are required to go over the continental divide. There are no locks on the Rhine from Amsterdam to the junction with the Main River. Then there are 34 locks on the Main River. 16 locks on the Main Danube Canal. 15 locks on the Danube between Regensburg and Vienna. And one between Bratislava and Budapest. The total number of locks between Amsterdam and Budapest is 66. The Canal de Dumer, or in English, the Two Seas Canal describes the path from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean, of which the Canal du Midi was the first man-made component, and the second is the Canal de Gironde. There are river barge-type cruises on the Canal du Midi. This is an example of an eight-passenger hotel barge on the Canal du Midi. This shows the location of the cruises on the Canal du Midi. America's Great Loop Is it possible to go by water, all of the way around the eastern part of the U.S., from the Gulf of Mexico, to the Atlantic Ocean and back? Yes. It is indeed possible to go by water all of the way around the eastern part of the U.S., from the Gulf of Mexico, to the Atlantic Ocean and back. It's called America's Great Loop. You can go up the Mississippi River to the Illinois River just north of St. Louis. Then on the Illinois River and some short canals to Lake Michigan near Chicago. Then through the Great Lakes using the Welland Canal to get around Niagara Falls to the St. Lawrence River, then down Lake Champlain to the Hudson River, New York City and the Atlantic Ocean. This is the Great Loop, a circumnavigation of the eastern U.S. and part of Canada. It is a system of waterways that encompasses the eastern portion of the United States and part of Canada. The Great Loop is made up of both natural and man-made waterways, including the Atlantic and Gulf Intracoastal Waterways, the Great Lakes, Lake Champlain, and the Mississippi and Tennessee Tom Big B Waterway. The entire loop stretches about 6,000 miles, 9,700 kilometers. You too can become a looper by joining the America's Great Lakes Cruisers Association. Or, you can do just part of the loop, like taking a cruise on the Mississippi River or the Great Lakes. We will next have a short video clip of introduction to the Great Loop.
This is a map of the principal hydrological divides of North America. The St. Lawrence River Divide, Magenta Line, separates the Great Lakes, St. Lawrence Watershed from the southerly watersheds of the Atlantic Ocean. The U.S. Intracoastal Waterway, ICW. The U.S. Intracoastal Waterway, ICW, is a 3,000 mile inland waterway along the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico coasts of the United States running from Boston, Massachusetts, southward along the Atlantic seaboard and around the southern tip of Florida, then following the Gulf Coast to Brownsville, Texas. Some sections of the waterway consist of natural inlets, saltwater rivers, bays, and sounds, while others are artificial canals. It provides a navigable route along its length without many of the hazards of travel on the open sea. The Intracoastal Waterway has two main sections. The Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway serves ports from Boston to Key West, Florida. The route is linked by several essential man-made canals, including the Cape Cod, Chesapeake and Delaware, and Chesapeake Albemarle. The second part is the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway that serves ports for more than 1,100 miles between Brownsville, Texas, and Apalachee Bay, Florida. The Gulf Intracoastal Waterway lies mainly behind barrier beaches and provides a 150-foot wide, 12-foot deep channel. At its eastern end, the waterway is not directly connected with its Atlantic counterpart, except via the open waters of the Gulf of Mexico and the 6-foot deep Okeechobee Waterway in southern Florida. The Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway The Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway runs from Norfolk, Virginia to the Florida Keys. It consists of natural inlets, saltwater rivers, bays, sounds, and artificial canals. It provides a navigable route along its length, without many of the hazards of travel on the open sea. Congress authorized the creation of the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway in 1919 and the entire waterway was completed in 1940. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is responsible for maintaining the waterway. An important link in the inland waterways of the U.S. is from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico. This connects Lake Michigan to the Mississippi River via the Illinois Waterway. The Illinois Waterway System provides a navigable link from the Atlantic Ocean via the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Great Lakes to the heartland of the U.S. and the Gulf of Mexico. The Illinois Waterway provides a shipping connection from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico via the Illinois and Mississippi Rivers. The Illinois Waterway is a system of rivers, lakes, and canals which consists of 336 miles, 541 kilometers, of waterways from the mouth of the Calumet River near Chicago and Lake Michigan to the junction of the Illinois and Mississippi Rivers of Grafton, Illinois. This illustrates the drop of the Illinois waterway from 578 feet, 176 m above sea level at Lake Michigan to 419 feet, 128 m, at the Mississippi River at Grafton, Illinois. There are eight locks and dams on the waterway. The Bay's Plains River, which flows into the Illinois River of the Mississippi River Basin, is very close to the shores of Lake Michigan near Chicago and the Great Lakes Basin.
This is a map and profile of the Illinois Waterway from the Mississippi River to Lake Michigan near Chicago. This is the Illinois and Michigan Canal that connects the Illinois River to Lake Michigan near Chicago. The canal opened in 1848. In 1900, the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal replaced it and reversed the flow of the Chicago River, so it no longer flowed into Lake Michigan. The United States Army Corps of Engineers maintains a 9-foot deep navigation channel in the waterway. This is the water route from the St. Lawrence River up the Richelieu River, the Chambly Canal, Lake Champlain, the Champlain Canal, and the Hudson River to the Atlantic Ocean. Lake Champlain is a natural freshwater lake bordering the states of Vermont and New York, and also the Canadian province of Quebec. Lake Champlain has a maximum length of 107 miles, 172 kilometers, and is quite narrow, with a maximum width of only 14 miles, 23 kilometers. The Chambly Canal is a National Historic Site of Canada in the province of Quebec. It is part of a waterway that connects the St. Lawrence River with the Hudson River in the United States. The Chambly Canal has 10 bridges, 8 of which are hand-operated and 9 hydraulic locks. The canal is 20 kilometers or 12 miles long with a typical passage time of 3 to 5 hours. The Champlain Canal is a 60-mile, 97-kilometers, canal that connects the south end of Lake Champlain to the Hudson River in New York. It was simultaneously constructed with the Erie Canal and is now part of the New York State Canal System and the Lakes to Locks Passage. The Erie Canal. This is a view on the Erie Canal painted in 1830 by John William Hill. We will next have a short video clip of the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal is a man-built waterway that travels across New York State and connects a path from the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean. And it probably would never have happened if it weren't for the determination and vision of a man named DeWitt Clinton. Clinton was the governor of New York, and he was convinced that building a canal would sustainably lower the cost of bringing goods from all over the country to his entire state. Not everyone agreed with him though, including President Thomas Jefferson, who thought the idea was crazy and refused to offer federal funding for the project. Luckily, Clinton was able to convince the state legislature to give $7 million for the construction. Work began on the canal in 1817, and one of the first problems was getting a stable workforce. Hiring locals was a failure, but soon Irish immigrants heard there was steady work in upstate New York and flocked to the project where they made 80 cents a day, a good salary at the time. The work was hard and long, and the laborers worked 14-hour days. Most of them didn't know anything about digging a canal, and they had to learn as they worked, developing tools and techniques along the way. It took years to dig the 363-mile-long canal. When it was finished, it was 40 feet wide and only 4 feet deep. Bands played and cannons boomed when Clinton opened the canal in 1825, and he was vindicated when it became an immediate success. Goods and people were able to travel faster and more cheaply, and trade was easier. The tolls collected soon paid the state of New York back for the entire cost of construction. Skeptics who first grumbled about DeWitt's ditch were proved wrong, and the success of the Erie Canal would soon inspire the building of more U.S. canals. We know about the Panama Canal that goes from coast to coast. What is the Florida Canal? 
Thick cross Florida barge canal would save three days of travel for ships if they didn't have to go all the way around the Florida Peninsula. And could instead cut right through the middle of the state. The planned route of the canal followed the St. Johns River from the Atlantic coast to Palatka. The valley of the Eklaha River to the coastal divide and the Withlacuche River to the Gulf of Mexico. About 28% of the 107-mile, 172-kilometers, project was built. This is a completed section of the Cross Florida Barge Canal near Palatka. Today. The Marjorie Harris Car Cross Florida Greenway provides hiking and biking trails on the remnants of the Cross Florida Barge Canal. This is the Cross Florida Greenway Bridge over I-75, just north of Marion Oaks. This shows the location of the Cross Florida Greenway Bridge on I-75 just north of Marion Oaks and east of Bellevue. What is the Cross Florida Railroad? The Cross Florida Railroad from Fernandina Beach on the Atlantic was started in August 1856 and reached Cedar Key on the Gulf in March 1861. The Cross Florida Railroad ran through Gainesville and was 155 miles long from coast to coast. Trade between ports like New Orleans and those in the Northeast U.S. no longer had to go around the Florida Keys. Is it possible to go by water all of the way across the U.S. from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean? This is the elevation profile across the U.S. from San Francisco to New York City. It looks impossible to go across by water. Here is a map showing the rivers of the U.S. The head of navigation of the Mississippi-Missouri system on the east is near St. Louis, Missouri, and on the Columbia Snake system. It is Clarkston, Washington. These two places are 1,458 miles apart and impossible to connect with a canal. But these did it. However, you have to be a fish with tremendous endurance. This was believed to be how the cutthroat trout migrated from the Snake River on the Pacific drainage to the Yellowstone River on the Atlantic drainage. I started in the Pacific Ocean, and then it was the Columbia River Snake River north to Ocean Creek Pacific Creek, and then the Atlantic Creek Yellowstone River Missouri River Mississippi River Gulf of Mexico Straits of Florida. And finally, the Atlantic Ocean. Here we see that the Yellowstone River, a tributary of the Missouri is very close to the Snake River, a tributary of the Columbia, at the Continental Divide in Wyoming. This is the Two Ocean Pass on the North American Continental Divide. In the Rocky Mountains of Wyoming near Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Parks. This is the Two Ocean Creek. This shows Two Ocean Pass in the Teton Wilderness, near Jackson Lake in Wyoming. The Teton Wilderness in northwestern Wyoming, just south of Yellowstone National Park is one of the most remote and rugged places in America. There one can see a branching of two ocean creek called Parting of the Waters. 
The Two Ocean Creek is an unremarkable little forest stream. But, as you might guess from its name, it's the only creek in America that flows into two oceans. And it is a 1,300 mile float to the nearest ocean. This unique hydrological spot was named a National Natural Landmark in 1965. The sign gives the distance in miles to the oceans as Atlantic Ocean 3488 and Pacific Ocean 1353. If you connect the two creeks watersheds on a map, they form a single line connecting Oregon and Louisiana. So the northeastern two-thirds of North America is technically an island. The explorers looking for the northwest passage between the oceans never realized that they could have sailed across America this way. If they'd used tiny little boats that could handle the six-inch depths of Two Ocean Creek. The Two Ocean Pass is notable for the parting of the waters, where one stream, North Two Ocean Creek, splits into two distributaries, Pacific Creek and Atlantic Creek at the parting of the Waters National Natural Landmark. The Atlantic Creek water eventually flows into the Yellowstone River and empties into the Gulf of Mexico via the Missouri River and Mississippi River. The Pacific Creek water eventually flows into the Snake River and empties into the Pacific Ocean via the Columbia River. This is a drawing made in 1894 of Two Ocean Pass with a view to the northeast. Atlantic Creek exits the pass between the hills in the upper part of the image. Pacific Creek exits to the southwest in the lower part of the image. North Two Oceans Creek enters from the left side of the image and divides into its two distributaries and South Two Ocean Creek enters from the right of the image and is also shown dividing into two streams. Here the Two Ocean Creek splits in two directions on the Continental Divide. Water on the left goes to the Atlantic and water on the right goes to the Pacific Ocean. The Snake River has its headwaters just inside Yellowstone National Park formed by the confluence of three tiny head streams on the Two Ocean Plateau, very close to the Continental Divide. One stream that feeds the Snake River is the Two Ocean Creek, at the Two Ocean Pass, a mountain pass on the Continental Divide. The Two Ocean Creek abruptly splits into separate streams one going off to the left and the other to the right. Each stream is joined by larger and larger streams and eventually reaches the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The stream to the left, called the Atlantic Creek, travels 3,500 miles, 5,613 kilometers, joining up with the waters of the Mississippi River and winding up in the Atlantic Ocean. The stream to the right, called the Pacific Creek, undertakes a 1,350-mile, 2,177 kilometers, trip joining up with the Snake and Columbia Rivers and empties into the Pacific Ocean. Aptly named the Two Ocean Creek, it's the only one in the United States that breaks and ends up in two different oceans. The point where the bifurcation occurs is called parting of the waters, and it sits directly atop the continental divide. Technically, it's possible for a fish to make the nearly 5,000 mile, 8,000 kilometers, freshwater journey from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean via the Two Ocean Creek. This was believed to be how the cutthroat trout migrated from the Snake River on the Pacific drainage, to Yellowstone River, on the Atlantic drainage. Recommended videos A journey around the rivers of America and Europe
Recommended video, European River Cruising. 8 need to knows and tips for first-time cruisers. Recommended video, European River Cruise Watch Out's 14 Things Brochures Don't Warn You About. Recommended video, 8 Best Regal Cruises in Europe, Travel Guide. Recommended video, Best River Cruises in Europe. Recommended video, Part 1 River and Small Boat Cruising in the U.S., What You Need to Know. Recommended video, 6 American River Cruises to Consider This Summer. Recommended video, Introduction to the Great Loop. Recommended video, Introduction to the Great Loop. Recommended video, YouTube Navigation. A Journey Around the Rivers of America and Europe, Part 2 Table of Contents. Thanks for watching. Please watch some more of my great videos.